Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode The Ancient Ones, the true story of the UFO contacts of Don Anderson. Don Anderson is a quiet and unassuming gentleman from a little town in Utah called Spanish Forks. He's had experiences his whole life, UFO sightings, landings, onboard encounters, many deeply spiritual experiences, a wide variety of paranormal activity, all of which is connected to his UFO contacts. He's had contact not only with gray type ETs, but praying mantis and human looking ETs as well. It's really quite a story with a lot of unique elements and a lot to say about what it's like to have ET contact and the nature of the phenomena and the ET agenda on our planet. So that's why I wanted to present his story to you today. In this episode, I'm going to play first-hand clips of the interview I did with Don so you can hear him tell his own story in his own words. Although Don is a contactee, he had no idea about this until he was 24 years old. At that time, he was a very religious man. He had a four-year-old son, and he was living alone, as I said, in this little town called Spanish Forks. And one evening, he woke up to see a gray entering into his room and coming for his four-year-old son, coming to take his son away. Don jumped out of bed and said, no, you're not taking him unless I can go along with him. And what was really remarkable is Don felt no fear. And in fact, seeing this gray alien, he suddenly recognized this ET as a friend, someone he's seen many times before. And this gray agreed to take Don on board with his son. So this is how it all began for Don. At the time he was very religious, he had no idea that things like this could happen. But I'll just let Don describe in his own words how this experience began. One of the reasons I went, that, it, it's like they came for my son, they actually came for both of us, but I, when they came for us, I looked at my son and I looked at the gray being, and there was a gray that was floating in the room that was initially the one who came and got us. And uh, he pointed at my son like he wanted to take my son. And I said, oh, you know what, you know, uh, let me go with you. If I go with you, then he's going to be okay and he's not going to freak out. Okay? And it's like I recognize this gray being. He'd been around forever, you know? So it was kind of like a friend of mine. Or his, I was very comfortable with him. And, um, yeah, he, this, this little gray being was like my teacher. And I would, they got me and my son. We went right through the walls of the house. We actually went through the ground, through the walls of the house. Uh, out in the atmosphere, and it was just like going into a giant vacuum. I mean, you could not hear anything. It was just really quiet, and, you know, but yet you could see the neighbor houses, and you could see the ship across the field, and all this kind of stuff. So once on board this craft, Don was greeted by a human-looking woman dressed in a brown and orange jumpsuit, who proceeded to have a conversation with him. And again, I'll just let Don describe this conversation in his own words. There's a lady who asked her to be around the ship. And uh, she was, you know, a typical human-looking Nordic type of a being. You know, was dressed in some sort of orange or brown jumpsuit. And uh, she was like my escort. She's kind of guided me around the ship. I had a, I had an issue that was going on with my stomach. There was a really, really bad case of irritable bowel at the time. And I looked at her and I said, "Hey, you know, is there something you can do?" I mean, we were speaking telepathically as we were walking along. And I said, "Is there something you can do to help me?" I said, well, "This is just hurting. I got to get this healed." And she just laughed at me. You know, and she thought that was so funny, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, no, you really hurt me, lady. I mean, you know, I'm asking you seriously for some help, and you're laughing at me. And then she looked at me in the side of my eyes, and she says, don't worry about it, you're going to be okay. 
And uh, later on, it pretty much showed itself up for the most part. You know, I'm, I've never been seriously bothered with it since then. So after speaking with this lady for a few moments, she guided him down a corridor to an archway and into another room. Inside this room, Don was amazed to see his son there playing with another child about the same age. They were playing with this weird device, which was spraying what looked like sparkly blue light all over them. They were having a lot of fun with it, so Don wasn't concerned. And I will just let Don describe this whole encounter again in his own words. Uh, there was a little boy that my son ran into that they were playing with. Okay, now this is kind of bizarre because what was going on with him was that they had taken him and uh, they were doing something with him. And so anyway, they took us on the ship and um, as we were walking along this corridor on the ship, there's an archway off to the right-hand side of us. We stop, we look in, and there's my son with this little boy who's about his same age. And they're standing around a vertical shaft that's going through the center of the ship. And around it is like a little catwalk, and um, hanging on this vertical shaft is what looks like a shower massage unit. Okay, and I would watch... And, I'd watch them as one of them would grab the shower massage unit and hold it on his head. You see this blue stream of, it looked like electricity or something, just flow down their bodies and dissolve into the catwalk. And they would break out laughing. One of them would break out laughing, whoever was holding it over their head. And this was happening to They'd break out laughing because it must have taken over something. And they were fighting over this. And uh, the other, his little buddy would grab it, put it over his head, and the same thing would happen. And, you know, it would go back and forth. And, and uh, it was like, well, there he is. You see him. He's okay. And we continued on with what we were doing. So there was this little kid that he met. So seeing that his son was okay, uh, he turned back to this lady who had a message for him. She proceeded to give him a number of predictions and prophecies, pretty much all about his personal life, his relationships. And again, I will let Don describe how this conversation unfolded. Yeah, my son was four years old. He was he would be five that year, and I was going to be twenty-five that year. So he he was four years old, and uh, he. he met a young kid on the ship who later turned out to be his friend that he ran into like about six months later. Wow. And um, they showed me a lot of stuff that happened in my life that came true that, you know, I, they showed me a lady and says, hey, you're going to meet this lady. And I did here about five years ago. I met her and uh, through some really odd circumstances. Then we were shown a few things. That, the things that we were shown all came about. They've all happened. Yeah, you know, so it was kind of a deja vu type of thing as well. So yeah, as it turned out, Don would later meet this woman, and it was quite a series of synchronistic events that these ETs predicted, and they all came true. Following this encounter, Don and his son were led back to their home and into the bedroom, and as it turned out, the other little boy was apparently brought along as well, though at some point he must have been returned to the craft because when they woke up, he was no longer there. But I will let Don describe how they were returned to their house. And, you know, before we were actually placed back in our beds, uh, we were in the living room. We were placed in the living room uh, towards the end of all this, and you could see across the street the ship was hovering. It was making some sort of noise. It was just kind of coming and but off to the right left hand side of me where I could hear somebody scuffling so I look over and it's him and his friend that he was on the ship with and they were kind of scuffling you know they're doing their kid thing they're just you know mess around and you know kind of sparring with each other this was actually one of his, his turned out to be his best friend that showed up later on about six months later they spent you know, the next six or seven years as best buddies. You know, these things just came about. They were there. It happened, so. Yeah. And that just, that opened up the floodgates, to be honest with you. It was like, there was so much 
ET activity that went on after that. And when she sent me back in my bed, I had immediate knowledge. It's kind of like a, <clears throat> excuse me, a near-death experience, except it was a UFO remembrance experience of all these experiences I had all the way up to and including before I was born. And it, it just kind of popped in like your life flashes before your eyes when somebody dies. It was like a UFO event of all these events that had happened. Some of them that I was a little bit aware of, some of them I had no idea about. Uh, but it happened up to that point in my life, uh, and it just kind of totally blew me away. It just, I, I had no idea that uh, this kind of stuff was going on out there in the universe. I didn't know where to go, how to, how to deal with it, or there was really nobody out there. So it just kind of led me on a lifelong search of, what was going on because I couldn't find any answers from anybody. And when I woke up, I, I just I was just blown away. I couldn't understand what was happening. So wow. it was a lifelong search. So. I was in a little town in Utah. It was uh, in central Utah, not too far away from Salt Lake City. And with all this happening, at the time I, you know, I was pretty religious. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do any of that kind of stuff, you know, I was pretty straight laced and so it was just like, this stuff shouldn't be happening, uh, <laughs> how do, you know, now all of a sudden there's this world out there of these beings and um, they're human looking and that they're not from Earth. So this experience turned Don's life upside down. He said it was very much like having a near-death experience because when he saw this gray and after being taken on board, he, it was like having a life review. He suddenly remembered all these events from his childhood onward which had made no sense to him. These were weird events that he had overlooked, denied, refused to think about, explained away as something normal. Uh, but now he realized he was a contactee and he remembered uh, many events which turned out to be direct UFO contact stretching not only to his childhood but to pre-life. And in fact, he remembered this gray taking him to his mother's hospital room when she was giving birth to Don. So he was actually there <laughs> witnessing his own birth. And I'll just let Don describe this absolutely incredible and unique event in his own work. He was the one who introduced me to my mom in the operating room when she was, you know, before she was ready to give birth to me, while she was giving birth. So he was the one who was escorting me into that operating room and, uh, you know, and he, he's just showing up again to uh, continue on with whatever it is they do. Another thing he remembered following this 1984 encounter were the many times strange beings, a strange figure, would enter into his bedroom. He described it as looking almost like an ape, and it would always frighten him. Sometimes the room would fill with light, and this being would appear, poke at him, pull on his blanket, sometimes actually pick him up and lead him out of the room through the wall. He remembered that happening many times, dozens if not hundreds. And sometimes he would remember being taken back into his room and placed back in bed. He of course told his mom, who freaked out. She called the police. The police could find no evidence of any intruders. They called the doctor and the doctor examined Don and pretty much concluded that Don must be having nightmares. Don disagrees with this. He was always awake when this happened, and he believes these were entirely physical events. Yeah, when I was a little kid, and a little kid in Spanish there was, uh, it was just, that was a little farming horse community. You only had maybe a couple thousand people living in it at the time. This was also a rural country at the time. Right. Um, they used to come in and get me at night, there was a period of about a month there where it was just like a house of horrors. Yeah, literally. It was like my mom was beside herself, you know, she couldn't figure out what was going on. Huh. Right? But we had the police over, and 
to everything, you know. I mean, yeah, the police, the doctors would come over, everybody would be over all the time because we'd wake up and I would wake up screaming my head off in the middle of the night, you know. The, have you seen communion? Okay, you remember the tenth time where uh, Whitley, who's played by Christopher Walken, was dancing for that little alien creature that was kind of looked like a old, small little ape or troll or something? Okay, that little creature would come and get me at night. It scared the hell out of me. All right? And he would just walk through the walls, and I knew when he was coming. I would sit up there in the corner and pull the sheets tight across my body, and uh, he would come in and try to tickle me, stick his fingers up underneath my arms, and it would scare the hell out of me. <laughs> and he would pick me up, and he would walk me through the walls. Yeah. Wow. And then they would put me back in bed, and after he put me back in bed, I'd wake up screaming, you know, telling my mom that the, you know, the ape man had come and got me, and the ape man was coming. And uh, so she'd call in the police, and the police would go around, and they'd look around the yard, and, you know, they'd never find any footprints, so the doctor would come over. And... Another really strange event that sticks out in Don's mind occurred when he was about 10 years old. He and his friend and their two brothers, their two little brothers, decided that they were going to go camping out in the front yard of their home. And the little brothers fell asleep while Don and his friend stayed awake late into the evening, and it was around 2 a.m. or so, when suddenly they had an incredible UFO display. It really shocked them. They went running into the house of Don's friends to try and wake up his parents, who would not wake up. It's an incredible event that ended up being an abduction. And I will just let Don describe this whole event in his own words. Tonight, that night, we decided we are going to sleep out in the front yard. And there are four of us. There's me, my little brother, and the two neighbor kids that lived down the road. And that, that night, uh, for whatever reason, there were two of us who stayed awake. We couldn't get to sleep. We woke up in the middle of the night, and we were messing around with our brothers trying to get them to wake up, and they wouldn't wake up, and we weren't hearing the dogs or anything, so we thought, well, this is really strange. Let's go down to your house, which is like about four houses down the street, and, uh, you know, see what's going on. So we go in there, and their parents were asleep, and they knew we'd wake up. Nobody would wake up in their house. So we were sitting out on the front porch eating a uh, apple, here, like maybe two or three in the morning, I'm not sure what time it was, staring out in the sky, and all of a sudden you could see this like great big old fireworks display start going off in the sky up above our heads, right? Right. And uh, you just fascinated us because you could see these orbs of light just flying across the sky, and it kept on going for like about 10 or 15 minutes, and then all of a sudden you could see the edge of the ship just kind of poke through like this. I don't know where it was coming from, but it just kind of pokes through the sky, and this great big ship starts forming and coming out of, I don't know where it came out of, it was like it was coming out of a cloud, right? But there weren't any clouds. Huh. And uh, that night we were taken again. I remember I, remember I was in there with his dad's bed shaking him, trying to get him up, you know. I'm saying, you got to get up, you know. Hey, get up, get up. And I was shaking as hard as I could, trying to get him up. And uh, nobody was waking up, and so they came and they got us that night too. So that was one that I didn't have any idea about until you know that night in June of '84. I didn't remember it at all. All I remember is waking up in the yard and Richard, who is my friend's brother, older brother, had grass all over all over his head that we piled up on him at night that we didn't remember doing. And something had scared him so bad he'd wet his pants. So that's what Don remembers. The last thing he remembers consciously is being in his friend's house trying to wake up his parents. And that's when Grays appeared. So that's probably when they were taken or perhaps returned. It was years later that Don did undergo hypnotic regression to this event. And he was surprised to find himself being taken on board a craft where he met Grace, 
Uh, this was not a fearful experience for him. And in fact, the greys were teaching him. They were teaching him how to do telekinesis. And they were also showing him their technology and showing him how to operate it. So this was quite an interesting experience for him, and it certainly was not his last experience. It was four years later when he had another major encounter. This was something he was never able to explain. All he remembered was he was hiking outside of his home one evening. He was about 14 years old, and he became disoriented. All he really remembers is suddenly being confronted by a herd of skunks and being chased down the mountain by them. Uh, he sometimes thought perhaps it was coyotes. He really wasn't sure. And it wasn't until this 1984 experience that he suddenly remembered this event as well. And what he remembered was being taken on board a craft. It had landed. He was taken on board. Inside it was very clean. There were all these computer-like screens. And I will just let Don, again, describe this in his own words. You know, I was 14 years old. I was stuck up in the canyon. They, it was about 10 miles away from anybody. There was nobody up there at all, just me. And uh, I had an experience up there where I had thought, <clears throat> this is going to sound really weird, but I had thought I had been chased down the canyon by a herd of skunks. You know, and uh, I... I because I could hear them off in the brush and the bush as they were chasing me down the road. And uh, it, I told the kids in school about it the next day when I got back down the canyon, or two days later when school started, when I got back down the canyon, uh, what had happened, they all laughed at me and said, yeah, oh, yeah, that's funny. And that turned into be a full-fledged abduction encounter where they had trapped me in... Uh, a place in the canyon so that they could, you know, take me and I was actually on a ship. I, have you ever heard of Bob Lazar when he describes that ship? I don't know if you're familiar with some of the things he's talked about, but he described a ship that he saw at Area 51. Okay, that ship that he was talking about was the exact same ship that they took me from, but it was years before... Bob Lazar had been to Area 51, and he had described the exact same ship that I was in. Yeah, and so, you know, whatever you want to think about Bob Lazar, good, for better or for worse, a lot of people say, yeah, he's full of huffy, and some people say he's a real deal. I believe he knew something because there's no way you could make the, the, the exact description of the place that I had been and the type of ship that I had been in uh, to be so precise like that. And the screens that they had on the ship were ultra high depth. I mean, it's like the OLED TVs that we have today. Uh, that's the kind of screen that you were seeing when the ships open. You, you know, when the vision opened up and you could see outside the ship, that's the kind of screens that they had, but it was way, way before high depth. We didn't have any idea what high depth was back then. And all these kind of experiences just popped up, and it's like, oh, my God. And they related directly to things that had gone on in my life that I wasn't, I knew that something weird had happened, but I wasn't sure what it was, so I just shut up about it because I couldn't explain it. So he remembered this much consciously, being taken on board and seeing greys, but he did undergo hypnosis, and under hypnosis he recalled that this UFO actually took off. He, they went way, way far away. He felt, feels like they went way deep into the Milky Way, and uh, he saw all kinds of stars around him. They came up to another very large donut-shaped craft. He was transported into this much larger craft. And on board this larger craft, he saw human-looking ETs, who he said were very wise. And they actually show, took him to meet who he believes was his deceased father. Don's father died when he was three years old, but he got to meet him on board this craft. So that was really unusual. And then he was taken into another room. And in this room, there were 15 to 20 other children, all about Don's age. There was also a very old looking, half human, half gray ET hybrid. And uh, this hybrid was teaching all the children, including Don, 
in alien language. So that was what he recalled at age 14. And uh, following this 1984 experience, it woke up Don's psychic abilities. He started having all kinds of out-of-body experiences, really profound ones, where he was taken to other dimensions, to what he believes are other planets, where he met high-level entities and would converse with them. He started having a lot of paranormal experiences, including precognition, psychic reading. He could see people's past lives. I mean, it was just off the charts, completely changed his life. And his experiences, of course, continued. It was some years later, following this 1984 experience, that he had one of the most profound onboard UFO experiences of his entire life. He and his friends, who were also contactees, a group of about four of them, decided that they were going to go up into the mountains of the Wintaw Basin in Utah. This is not far from Skinwalker Ranch, actually. And they were going to try to contact the mantis-like ETs. They were all interested in this type of ET and wondered what it would be like to meet them. So they all were meditating on this. They went up into the mountains. One of them had a trailer where they could stay. And uh, that evening they had a major encounter. They not only saw a UFO, but the mantids showed up and each of them had a very profound and very personal encounter with them. And I'll just let Don describe his own encounter with these mantis-like beings in his own words. I had a cabin with the praying mantis creatures after that. Uh, me and three other people in the mountains of northeastern Utah. You know where uh, the Skinwalker Ranch is? It's uh, not too far away from the Skinwalker Ranch. There's a little community called Fruver. And I had a friend who's got a trailer up there. And we went and stayed in the trailer up there. We had a experience with the praying mantis that uh, pretty much just changed your whole life. I mean, you know, when you meet with these guys, at least these particular beings that I met with, there's nothing that you can describe it to. It's just totally out of this world. We decided that we were going to go up in the, uh, four of us were going camping up this trailer and and we wanted to have an experience, an encounter of some sort. And so we kind of decided, yeah, the other, the praying mantis, we heard about him, but, you know, didn't really know much of anything about him at the time. And so, well, oh, let's have an experience and see if we can call the praying mantis in. You know, it's just kind of an experiment that we were doing. And that night, uh, we were sitting out on the front porch, and you could see it was cloudy. It had been just a little bit of sprinkling. It was cloudy that night overcast and the sky just parted it was like a great big donut hole pops up into the sky and you know this great big circle formed over our heads and you could see stars and everything up in the sky that you'd never seen before i mean it was just like looking up there and saying i don't recognize any of these stars but it was beautiful and you could see this ship it was a triangular ship that was up there kind of bouncing around inside this circle like you got the impression it was kind of clearing the space out for us. It wasn't too long after that that we start hearing these chirping sounds. It was like, you know, clicking. Right. You know, they kind of set of threes, and you'd see these figures moving up and down the road, and uh, you could see them kind of like a shadow creature. You would see a shadow creature, except you could see that there are these praying mantis looking beings that are like nine feet tall. Yeah, just huge. And they showed up to our camp that day, you know. And um, how we got, we, we became aware of them is that there was an outhouse in the backyard. And, you know, you have to walk around the trailer go to the backyard because that's the way that you had to, you know, go to the bathroom. And the air behind the trailer dropped by about 20 degrees. You know, I mean, the temperature changed so drastically that, you know, it was really kind of bizarre. I mean, and uh, looking off into the fields right there, you could see these beings running around, and all of a sudden they just started approaching us. 
and by approaching us, I mean, I would go in the backyard and I would say, hey, I want to see you. And then one of them would show up next to me and he would say, <clears throat> are you sure you want to see me? I said, yeah, I want to see you. He says, are you sure you want to see me? I said, yeah, I want to see you. Said, and then he would say, nope, and he would run off. Yeah, but you would hear him running off and you could see him and you could hear the voices in your head and all that kind of thing. So I did this twice and the second time I did it, I could feel his like, it was an arm that was kind of looked like a little bit like a praying mantis wing in a way, but it was his arm and it placed over my shoulder. You saw this blue electrical energy just flow all over my back and it, it I asked him the same question, and I said, well, I want to see you. And the, the third time, he said, no, not yet. You're not quite ready, you know, to see us. And so I walked back out front, and we're sitting down, and everybody was sitting around the porch looking out the front yard. And you could see out in the front yard that one of my friends had actually was standing out there with one of these things. that It picked her up, raised her about three feet off the ground, you know, and was looking at her, like, right in the eyes. And then you could see her slowly start settling back down on the ground again. I mean, literally, she was, like, up off the ground. The sink picked her up. Yeah. And uh, they were all just running around, and we were just sitting there kind of amazed, watching them run around, and the energy was just totally different. And they were doing their thing, and we were doing our thing. And then the clouds kind of came back, and they disappeared. You know? And so we sat out on the porch for about a half hour after they'd gone, and nobody said a word, and then all of a sudden we all looked at each other. It's bedtime. That's when we all jumped to bed. I mean, just like as fast as we could get to bed, we went to bed. So after this long series of face-to-face -face encounters with the mantids, uh, suddenly and without any warning, everyone felt compelled to just go to bed. There was no discussion about what happened. There was no talking. Everyone, just like zombies almost, went directly to bed. And it turned out uh, many of them did have an onboard experience that night, including Don. In fact, as soon as Don went into bed, the next thing he remembers, and this is fully consciously, is walking down a dirt road near this trailer and into what was like a portal or a doorway, and he found himself on board what was presumably this huge triangular craft that they had seen. There were mantids on board. This is a long and extensive experience. The mantid began to talk to Don. Uh, first, he was taken to be de decontaminated. He was shown this device, much like a crystal ball, which showed him various events in his life. He was taken for a very interesting sort of telepathic communication event with other entities. And I will just let Don describe in his own words this really fascinating onboard encounter. And it was a dirt road. It was a country road, you know. I was walking up the road, and there's this kind of a portal door that appeared over this ravine. And they had me walk through this portal door. And as I walked into this portal door, it's like I walk right into their ship with the thing who had placed his arm around me. He was there kind of like waiting for me, okay? And it was one of these triangular ships that you hear about, the great big old, you know, 300-foot long triangular ships with an orange ball in the middle. And I found myself right in the middle of this ship, and there's a catwalk that we were walking down. He was on by the side of me, walking down the catwalk towards the middle of the ship, like the catwalk was coming from each corner right to the center and right in the center I could look down and I could see the orange ball in the middle of the ship below us and there was a podium right in front of us you know and uh, that podium it had a little ball on top and it had like if you do like the Spock salute you could place your hand right on that ball and it would sh a big screen would pop up and it would show you your past life, I mean, your life events, your future life and past life. And you watch it kind of flow past you as you had your hand on this little ball. Look at me, I looked at him and I said, well, what is this? And he thought for a couple of seconds trying to figure out what the words were for. And he says, oh, this is deja vu, you know, which is basically scenes of your future life. Uh, we walked a little bit farther 
past that and I'm standing in front of a door that's like about eight feet tall. And I, no, it's probably more than that. It's probably like about 12 feet tall door. And we're standing in front of this door and you can hear a whoosh and the door opens and you walk inside and there's this room. And at the far end of the room, there's like a laser light that's right there that's real up really high. It's up like in the corner. And when I walk in, it scans my body. It does a body scan on me. And so I looked over at him again and I says, well, what's this? And he looks back at me and he said, like he's having a hard time trying to figure out that language. He goes, oh, soap. So this was some sort of a cleansing light, you know. It was like it was scanning for germs or something, I guess, is one of the best way to do it, or attachments and things of that nature. And as soon as it was done off the left-hand side of me, there's another door that opens up. And I'm looking into this large room. It's got a kidney-shaped table on it. And uh, there's a little stand. It's a rectangular stand on top of it. There's a big crystal ball. And if you're looking across the room, you can see this great big glass window. And it's looking out into space. I have no idea where we're at, but, you know, I didn't recognize anything. How am I going to recognize anything anyway, even if I knew what it was, right? It was immense. I mean, I, I had no idea where we were at. We were out there someplace, and it was just totally a novel view that he had. And around this table, there was 26 other people sitting around this kidney-shaped table. And it's like, well, you know, now you're here. We've kind of been waiting for you. And uh, I'm standing there, and as I'm standing there, you can see this ball. This is like this big crystal ball starts to glow a little bit. And as it starts to glow, everybody, everyone around the table, and myself included, you can see this stream of light flow out of the top of each one of us. We draw, all drop into this big ball that's sitting there in the middle of this table. You can see all this energy just swirling inside this ball. And then it just kind of shoots back out the top of back up, back into each of our heads. I don't know what that was about, but it was just like we're doing this energy sharing thing. Uh, the next thing I remember, we're sitting on top of the ship in a bubble. You know, it's just like there's me and him, and we're sitting out there by ourselves up on top of, I get the impression it's on top of the ship, you know, and there's a dome that's covering us, and that's all I can see is just the dome. Okay. He looks at me and he says, would you like to see? I said, sure, I'd love to see. And the minute I said that, everything disappears, and it's just me sitting out there in the middle of the universe. Okay, there's nothing. There's no ship. There's nothing. I'm just floating out there all by myself. And you can feel this tone out there. It's like that's the best way to put it. It's just like a musical note starts to build up, and you can feel this tone building up in the universe, and it just kind of flows through you like like if I was going to take it, I was going to breathe on you, and that breath goes right through you, and it, you can feel it touch every single cell in your body as it's going through kind of what it was like, you know, and I'm, and it's just amazing because you're sitting out there, and it's just you and the universe and the stars, and yeah, it was just, just, just totally was a mind-blowing type of thing, you know, it was just like, wow, and I don't know how long I'm out there, but then all of a sudden, I'm back into this dome. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up in my sleeping bag and my body is burning up. Literally, it's just kind of burning. You know, it's like I am sweating so profusely that I can't stand it. And it's like 40 degrees outside, so it's kind of cold. Huh? So it was just, it was just one of those mind-blowing type of, you know, things right there. So that was Don's most profound onboard UFO encounter. So he's had many other experiences, far too many to describe in an episode of this size. I mean, I could go on forever, but 
One day, Don became very curious about why he was having so many encounters. Why him? And in his search for answers, he decided to take a DNA test. And boy, did he get a shock when he found out that he has a very rare condition known as uniparental dysonomy. What this means is when a person has genetics that come almost exclusively from one parent. The vast majority of these cases usually involve people who have their genetics coming from their mother. Uh, it's much more rare that they come from a person's father. And that was true in Don's case. 99% of his genetics come from his father. And I'll just let Don describe how he discovered this. I had a, a DNA analysis done on myself because I just wanted to, you know, kind of see where my background was because I know on my mom's side of the family, they had been like, you know, eighth and ninth generation Americans. And so I'm thinking, well, I wonder if there's some American Indian background in there someplace. You know, that would explain why I do all the psychic stuff. And um, I have no genetic material from my mother at all. Like, no wonder I grew up with that family thinking, I don't know who these people are. Yeah, I, I feel like I was not related to them. I didn't know who they were. And I kept telling my son, I said, I don't know who these people are. I don't know why I'm living in this house. I said, this is just, you know, I have nothing in common with these folks. Next are normal otherwise, but it just shows that 97% of my genetics is straight from my dad's side of the family, which is Nor Norwegian. Okay, well, it's not Norwegian. It's uh yeah, it's Norwegian and Danish. It's Scandinavian. One, it's almost 100%. Yeah, there's nothing else there, just his side of the family. So more experiences followed. Lots of paranormal experiences. He started communicating with spirits occasionally with his deceased grandmother. Uh, was found he had the ability to give psychic readings. Lots of very powerful synchronicities. All kinds of amazing stuff happened. And on one occasion, he was actually healed. He had been suffering from a very severe chest cold, and he just couldn't shake it. And then one day, he was in his home when in walks this human-looking E.T., dressed in a jumpsuit, it had a little symbol on its jumpsuit, and this E.T. proceeded to heal him by feeding him medicine, a glowing pink liquid in a little vial. And I will just let Don describe this very unusual experience in his own words. You know, I have been suffering these really debilitating chest colds, you know, that it just almost on the verge of pneumonia type of stuff that had been hitting me really, really hard for, you know, like about three months. It would go away, then it would hit, then it would go away, then it would hit again, then it would go away, then it would hit again. And, uh, I was really into the meditation thing at the time, and I was sitting there meditating one day, and um, this alien guy shows up, that's the best way to put it, and he has this neon pink vial of liquid in his hand, and he looks at me, he hands it to me, and he says, drink this. It was kind of a thick consistency. But it really didn't have much of a taste to it. It was just kind of like, a, you just drink and swallow real fast and it's gone, yeah. Oh, okay. well, it was just maybe, maybe about three ounces or something like that. It wasn't very much. Vial, it was just a little clear vial like you would find in a, if you went to, say someone from a lab or something, they'd have a little vial sitting there, similar to that. And so I drank that, and immediately I was better, and I've never had any problems with uh, a settling cold again. It's never, never ever hit me. Yep, that was it. He just left. He just disappeared. You know, he's, that was it. He, this guy right here <clears throat> was kind of a grayish looking guy. He was dressed in a silver kind of a jumpsuit, I had kind of a, on the left breast, it's got this little emblem of some sort, I can't exactly know for sure what what it is, but I know there's a little design there of some sort, 
It's almost like he's got a little belt of some sort. But uh, he's taller. He's got longer hair. He ties it back, but he puts his hair in a bun. And that's how they wear their hairs in a bun. And he's got these eyes where if these eyes, you stare into his eyes, <clears throat> it's like he's looking right through you. I mean, they're so piercing. They're so, you know, matter of intense. they got this intensity about them that just will look right through you. And it sends shivers up and down your back when he does. <clears throat> I've met him a couple times. He's got, he came in the bathroom one time when I was taking a bath and had my eyes closed. I watched him walk in and, and it just, like, so it froze me up solid, you know. It was, like, really, really powerful, overwhelming. He looked like a normal person to me, but he had these kind of almost chiseled features on his face that was a perfect-looking face. And uh, it's his eyes that really gave him away. I mean, he'd look at you with those eyes, and it's like, Okay, you know from around here, you just automatically know that there's something really different about him. Yeah. Yeah. He showed up a number of times. So Don has seen this being on other occasions. Once he was suffering from a heart condition and he was healed. This was when I had my heart surgery, when I was laying in my bed in my house, on the couch in my house. And um, he showed up and boom, all of a sudden I'm in this room someplace, and it's kind of a hospital-like setting. I get very much of it was a healing center of some sort that they had me in, that they were doing some sort of healing on me to help me get better. On another occasion, he was actually threatened by MIB types, or government agent types, who told him not to talk about his experiences. This really angered Don, and he decided he was going to go public with his experiences. He had no plans to go public at that time, but after being threatened, he decided it was important to do so, and he went to a convention where he spoke publicly about his experiences, and uh, he started thinking about writing about them as well. I have had the military abduct me once upon a time, too, which really cut up the stars. Oh, yeah, that threatening stuff has is, is been a continual thing. I'm the military abducted me. They told me not to speak. Before they came and got me, they told me not to speak about this. And they said, hey, don't talk about this stuff. And I said, well, come on, man. You know, don't be so paranoid. I'm going to talk about it because I'm just an ET guy, contactee, you know. I'm not a big one by any means, you know. I'm just a guy who's had some experiences who's, you know, not afraid to share my mind on what's happened, right? Right. And then... Um, they show up and they say, hey, don't talk about this. And uh, so after that, I said, well, screw you. I'm writing a book. So I wrote a book and went to speak at a conference up in Seattle, at the Seattle UFO Network Conference. He wanted to put out a website where he could put forth some of the spiritual information he learned. And he was trying to think of a good name for his website. And that's when this same being who healed him showed up and told him what to name the website. So it's not like, it's for the website that I've got, I've got a, I, I was thinking about what to call my website that I have, and it's called Shabala. And I'm, I was thinking for a long time, me and my girlfriend at the time, we were thinking about what we were going to call it, you know. He drops in one day, uh, as I'm waking up and he walks right up to him and he looks at me and he says, you should call it Shabala. I said, well, what do you mean? You mean Shambala? That's already been taken. He said, no, Shabala without the M. I go, Shabala? He says, yeah, call it Shabala. So after doing some research about the word Shabala, he found out that it means spirit of the ancient ones. So that's what he decided to name his website, which is still running today. And Don offers to give people spiritual information, past life readings, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, he's, like I said, a very quiet and gentle man. He is seeking no publicity. Uh, he's not interested in fame or fortune. 
He's just a deeply spiritual, very quiet gentleman, somewhat shy. Uh, he has spoken publicly, as I said, on his experiences. And in fact, uh, his account does appear in a few books. Uh, one book that his story appears in is called We Are Among You Already, True Stories of Star Beings on Earth. He's also written a couple of books. One of the books that he wrote is called The Wanderer, A Soul's Journey. And another book is called Musings of an Old Soul, A Cosmic Paradigm. Don's full story is told in my book, Wondrous, 25 True UFO Encounters. Uh, Don is not, again, seeking any publicity, but he knows his experiences are quite profound and unusual, and I think that's why he consented to being interviewed for my book. Uh, and I'm really glad he did. Because, as I said, I think his encounters have a lot to say about the nature of the UFO phenomena, how it can be so frightening in the beginning, and how it often transforms into a deeply spiritual experience and can actually move someone along the pathway of enlightenment to a remarkable degree. That, I really think that's what it's about. I mean, it's, I've spent a good portion of my life talking about the... Uh, physical things that have happened that have gone on, but when it boils down to it, it's not about the physical stuff at all. It's about how it changes you as an individual. And that inner perspective to look inside and to go for the answers where that's where you find them, is on the inside. That's certainly true in Don's case. That's why I wanted to do this episode today. I hope you've enjoyed watching. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers and keep having fun.